All right, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, latest uh, aviation disaster, uh, Air Asia Flight 8501, of course, uh, still whereabouts unknown and uh, over 160 people on board. Uh, our friend Joe Concha, columnist at Mediaite.com, joins us. And Joe wrote a great piece, which, you know, you don't, you, let, let's, let's get this clear right away. No one's mocking the tragedy. No one's mocking the fact that a plane went down and all these lives that touched so many other lives um, appear to be lost. Uh, but Joe wrote a piece, New Missing Plane Already Means More Cockamamie Conjecture on CNN. And Joe, all through the weekend, the second this plane went down, and right through today, 99% of the programming I've seen on CNN is the same repetitive over and over and over and over about how what the plane, the weather, what could have happened, where could it be. I, I, this might go on all week. That's right. And, and Steve, the, the, the part about this that from a journalism perspective is a little unsettling is that there aren't too many new facts known. We, the plane, it's, people still don't quite know uh, where it is. They think it may be in the Java Sea. But again, it's a lot like MH370 where we don't have a lot of facts. So what happens when you don't have a lot of facts? You simply speculate. And, and we saw over the weekend one particular segment caught my eye. Uh, a Mary uh, Shivo, who is a CNN aviation expert, uh, came on and said the following. He said, at this point, given it was extremely bad weather, the chances of it being some sort of terrorist activity are very small because most terrorist activity takes place in good weather. What? Yeah. Uh, and she cites 9-11 as an example. That was a clear <laughs> blue, uh, you know, sunny day and, you know, terrorist. So if they wanted to blow up the plane or take it down they, just into the ocean, they would wait for good weather. I don't get that at all. Well, Steve, it's the UV index. That, that, that <laughs> you see, folks, we're, we're not like making it. fun of the fact that the plane went down, but the, the, it's the stupid commentary. And, the, and, you know, you can't blame Mary Schiavo because they're putting her on every 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, and then you, what do you got to do during – I mean, you host a show for three hours. You know that, you know, if you, you got to fill all these hours, you're going to lead to some conversations going off on some tangents just so that you can limp to the next commercial since you're not covering anything else. So in this case, they asked her if it was a terrorist attack. Uh, obviously, it was, you know, it, it's looking like it probably was not. No one's taking credit for it anyway. But remember, she's an aviation expert. Right. Steve. She's not an anti terrorism, uh, any kind of task force or, or served in that area. So she's going outside of her jurisdiction, and then it becomes disrespectful for the families that want news on this sort of thing uh, to hear CNN people talking about good weather affecting terrorist activity. Uh, this is where we're getting into a, a very unsettling phase of journalism. And Joe, uh, CNN's uh, State of the Union had a, a, quite an impressive lineup for a holiday season they had uh, Rick Perry Lindsey Graham I, I, I realize that they're they're only uh, you know Republicans but nonetheless they were all bumped for this coverage right uh, yes uh, that that show was uh, completely bumped uh, just to cover the plane um, I understand the plane obviously that's a big story but you could do for instance what, what other networks did uh, like Fox for instance that this, that would do updates uh, for instance through Howard Kurtz's show which I appear on media buzz uh, at every half hour saying, okay, here's where we are, or be mentioned throughout the show, but you don't just scrap everything just to cover uh, this flight, particularly with, because this is American journalism we're talking about, I don't believe, and you could correct me on this, or any Americans that were on that flight, so I, I think they're just trying to replicate some of the rating success they had back in March and April with the original plane, and then I, I think when the numbers come out later, Steve, we're going to see that viewers simply aren't flocking to this uh, sort of wall-to-wall -wall coverage again because they're kind of like, I've seen this movie before and I'm not sure I trust CNN's credibility given all the black hole speculation from the last one at this point. Right. right. Uh, well, uh, well, 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 luckily there was some Sunday programming yesterday. We only have a couple of minutes left. I don't know if you caught uh, Major Garrett filling in for Bob Schieffer with Rudy Giuliani. And uh, she, uh, I got to tell you, I was surprised that Garrett, who used to lean left when he was at Fox, I, I mean right when he was at Fox, uh, nonetheless, he said, uh, you've claimed that uh, Barack Obama's anti-police in his rhetoric, and I've covered him for years, and I've never seen anything like that. I don't have, uh, do you want to take it back? And all Giuliani had to say, which left um, Major Garrett saying, hmm, interesting, was the guy loves Al Sharpton. He sits next to Al Sharpton. He takes advice from Al Sharpton. He marries himself to Al Sharpton. He says, it's like me going after the mafia, which I did as a, as a prosecutor, and sitting next to a Gambino. He says, you know, it, it doesn't work. It's a great analogy that, that Rudy used there, and he certainly he seemed more like the mayor uh, lately over the last week or two than than uh, Mr. De Blasio has, and and certainly he's running into all his problems in terms of the police turning their backs on him during the funeral. Uh, Bratton now saying that he uh, regrets sitting uh, so close to Sharpton uh, during a, yep. a re press conference. Uh, if Bill De Blasio wants any credibility with the MIPD, he will have to divorce himself 
from Al Sharpton, who was always seen as, as anti-police. As for the president, uh, I agree with Major to a certain extent. I don't know. Obviously, he's not anti-police, but there was that beer summit you remember way back when. Right, we Cambridge, and uh, and you know, and and to me, he's never said, you know, don't disobey the police. Always respect the police. That can't come out of his mouth for because that's not who he is. Anyway, Joe, uh, happy New Year. We'll speak to you soon, my friend. Thank you very much. Happy New Year, Steve. Take care. Read Joe Concha at Mediaite.com. All right, we'll be back with the Molesburg panel right after the break. But first, August 6, 1945, the United States became the first and only nation to use atomic weaponry when it dropped an A-bomb on the city of Hiroshima. It leveled the city, marking the end of World War II. Of course, Obama wanted to apologize for that. Let's take a look back at that with this hour's American Moment. Four years, eight months, and one day after the Japanese surprise attack on Pearl Harbor, marking America's entrance into World War II, a B-29 bomber nicknamed the Enola Gay dropped the world's first atomic weapon. The date was August 6th, 1945. In a split second, the world had entered the nuclear age. Captain Paul Tibbetts, Jr., in command of the Enola Gay, gave a first-hand account of the events for reporters back home. Well, as the bomb left the airplane, we took over uh, manual control, made it an extremely steep turn to try and put as much distance between ourselves and the explosion as possible. With the Japanese refusing to surrender and Allied intelligence determining that a land invasion of their homeland could result in a million Allied casualties while killing many more Japanese, President Truman ordered the first atomic bomb be dropped on Hiroshima. Dubbed Little Boy, the device exploded 1,900 feet above the awakening Japanese city of Hiroshima, instantly reducing 68,000 of the city's buildings to rubble and annihilating some 80,000-plus people. Despite the devastation, the Empire of Japan again refused to surrender. Consequently, three days later, on the 9th, a second atomic weapon was dropped on the city of Nagasaki, with the same devastating results. Still, the Japanese refused to surrender. So a third atomic bomb was being prepared to be dropped on Tokyo itself. On the 15th of August, 1945, the Emperor of Japan had announced the unconditional surrender of his nation. The greatest war known to man was finally over. For Newsmax TV, I'm Bill Curtis, and this is an American...